entrepreneurs, business owners, professionals who seek excellence, bringing the business classroom to you. It's the Business Builder Show. Here's Marty Wolf. We still got a long way to go. Yes, we all got a long way to go. Welcome to the Business Builder Show with Marty Wolf and today with our guest host, Jay Kelly Hoey. Along with Kelly and our executive producer, D.C. Taylor, we will be your guys on this learning journey. To learn more about Kelly, check out her website at jkellyhoey.co. That's jkellyhoey.co. Okay, Kelly, let's get the conversation going. Thanks, Marty. I am absolutely thrilled to have back on the Business Builder Show today, Ginny Gilder, who is a co-owner, with a trip over my tongue in this interview before I've even started, co-owner of the uh, WNBA team, the Seattle Storm. Thanks for coming back on the show, Ginny. Thanks for inviting me, Kelly. It's great to be here. So for those who aren't aware, um, you've uh, the WNBA has got a new collective bargaining agreement, um, and it's kind of different from previous agreements in the WNBA, and I think it's kind of important uh, sort of in a wider perspective than the league. So for those who have, may have missed the story, can you give some sort of highlights on, on where the WNBA is at with this new collective bargaining, bargaining agreement? Sure. First of all, the WNBA is about to start its 24th season. So we're still in the kind of annals of sports leagues, babies. You know, we're kind of just coming out of teenagehood. Maybe we're heading into early adulthood. I'm not quite sure. Um, But we're young. And this collective bargaining agreement uh, kind of came from, I would say, not two separate perspectives, but a confluence of uh, shifting points of view. First of all, uh, the players, you know, and that's this is the great thing about young people. Having been one a few a few decades ago, I can remember, you know, the players are very impatient with the kind of social uh, milieu in which women's pro sports operates, and they see what their male counterparts earn, they see all the celebrity, and they want part of that. And being young, they are impatient, and they're not interested in discussions as to why it is the way it is and that you should wait. So you have that. And then on the other side, you have people, you know, owners, uh, league officials, people who have been in the business for years, decades, in many cases, who, you know, looking at the state of the league and thinking, you know, like business people, primarily along the lines of, we got to make this thing grow. You know, and what do you do if you want to grow a sport? if you want to grow any business. And so those two fact, those two points of view, not really oppositional, came together to create a very different future for the league, um, where what the owners did, uh, led by you know, Kathy Engelbert, our new commissioner, was really to say, we want to invest. We're going to take some risk here and grow our business. It's just like any other entrepreneur, frankly. It's just, you know, we don't really have male sports businesses to compare to because they're in a very different situation or a different part of their life cycle, if you will. Yeah. Talk about that for a second. Talk about the the ownership structure of the league for, you know, those who aren't familiar with it, as well as kind of the landscape, the women's professional sports. They're just, as you've noted, so vastly different than men's. So the WNBA is owned Half by the NBA, 50% of the WNBA uh, is owned by the NBA, and then the other 50% is owned by the 12 franchises. So each franchise owns one-twelfth of one-half, which is about 4%. Um, So when you talk about the owners uh, investing in the CBA uh, in the collective bargaining agreement, and you look at the changes that were made, it's really the franchise owners who have taken on the financial risk because some of the elements of the CBA, the uh, the cap, the set pl- player salary cap went up by 30%. We added a huge amount you know, of travel and medical benefits, maternity benefits, uh, marketing agreements to support the players to um, stay in the US and not play abroad, all of that hits at the franchise level. So that's that's the business model. Um, In terms of 
kind of what's happening in the greater world. Uh, everybody knows, well, I don't know if everybody knows, but if you follow sports at all, women's sports at all, a lot of people know about what's happening with USA soccer and the huge uh, judicial fight for pay equity there. And the Me Too movement has really impacted kind of the public's view on, frankly, the treatment of women across many aspects of life, business, sports, celebrities. I mean, we have the um, Weinstein verdict that just came down. And all of that factors into how women women are looked at in terms of the pro sports lens. And still today, um, the media plays a huge role in showcasing or frankly, not showcasing women's pro sports. You have over 40% of college athletes are women and you have less than 4% of sports coverage focused on women. So we're still in this much bigger social milieu that affects our business in a way that if you were just selling some kind of widget, wouldn't necessarily affect your thinking and your business and marketing decisions. Yeah, because so much of the marketing of sports is, is you know, say those corporate dollars and, and the sponsorships and, you know, all, all of that good stuff that comes with it. You, you sort of mentioned the players overseas. Um, again, if you could just kind of give a quick background. So many of the WNBA players play for multiple teams, have, have had to in the past play for multiple teams because of, of the salaries, correct? Well, it's interesting. I didn't know this. I just learned this a few weeks ago myself that when the WNBA started, uh, Val Ackerman was the first president of the league, and she was just uh, she gave an interview a few weeks ago saying that the league deliberately organized their it, its schedule so that players could play full year in two leagues. I think understanding at the time that the WNBA was new, it was an I think maybe they wouldn't have said it was an experiment, but the idea was that increase the players' opportunity to make a year-round living. Um, by playing for more than one team. And that worked very well for a long time. And now um, many players play in the WNBA and then they play in Europe or Asia in the WNBA's off season. But what's happened for uh, on the WNBA side is we've come to realize that to the extent we can keep our players in the U.S. is the extent to which we believe we can build our business. So from the owner's perspective, was how do we make it more enticing to not just play in the WNBA, but commit to it? Yeah. yeah so yeah, that's, yeah. that's kind of part of the thinking on the owner's part. Yeah, I mean, seriously, you think so? Sort of think the wear and tear on uh, these athletes' bodies, the the travel. Um, you know, sitting at a time right now where you know traveling, it, it doesn't have a lot of appeal uh, given uh, the coronavirus. Uh, so uh, yeah, what well, you know, there's there's big risk there. And you're right how, again, you get back to how do you grow the business? Um, you know, if the athletes aren't here um, and and promoting and and available for sponsors and promotion and marketing, you know, what what kind of happens? Um, you know, from sitting here on the sidelines, uh, the this current collective bargain agreement kind of looks like win-win. Um, you know, what's what's the benefit? You know, thinking again, like you know, advice for other business owners. What's what's the benefit of not working at cross purposes? Well, you know, I'm not. Even though I was an athlete in my um, in my youth, uh, I always uh, I didn't really view my competitors as enemies, right? It's, and I think it's the same thing here. You can't view the folks who are integral to your business as a problem. You need them. Just like any labor negotiation, you need that your workforce to be in partnership with you. So, you know, we're always looking, and not only that, (laughs) I mean, especially in our business, you aren't going to find Uh, You know, you scratch the surface of most of the people who work at the league, most owners, um, you're going to find feminists, right? People who believe in the whole social justice play, if you will, that the WNBA represents. So, so many of us, even though we're negotiating across the table from the players, we want the same thing that they want for them. So that dynamic um, really played out in the negotiation of the CBA. Yeah, so, so I'm going to say it's kind of hard to be negotiating one way and, and feeling in your soul something else. I, you know, 
that would kind of be an awkward, right. awkward <laughs> position to be in. <laughs> It would be, Kelly, but that's the whole idea of when you think about growing the pie, instead of trying to take a bigger slice of a pie of a certain size, in fact, let's grow the pie so that everybody benefits. And the players, by the way, have, you know, who in some ways, they're not in some ways, in all ways, they're much hipper than us 50 and and older year olds, right? They just know they have, most of them have a much better sense of the social media world and even the marketing aspects of the league. And they were really pushing vocally um, that the league needed to do more. And why wouldn't you listen to that? Why wouldn't you listen to your partners? We're right. their experts. And I do think, you know, many of them have become very adept at parlaying their WNBA platform into a much broader platform for what is important, you know, to really talk about what's important to them. Yeah. So, I mean, talking about parlaying it, um, you know, what's, you know, kind of in this role of this business, there's the role of fans. Um, and what's kind of, uh, you know, how do you, par- how do you parlay this impatience? How do you par- parlay this new partnership? How do you parlay that to getting us, the fans, to get our butts in the seats? You know, it's interesting. I, I think that ultimately, yes, we absolutely need to grow our fan base. But how do fans or, pretend, you know, how do humans find out about the WNBA? There's kind of two ways. One is through the media. And the other is through, frankly, corporate partnerships. So for the WNBA to grow, the broadcasters are really going to have to start taking on the idea that they need to take a little more risk themselves and start investing in, um, in content that's focused on women athletes. Um, you have to expand the exposure in order for average people across the country to discover that there is a WNBA. Same thing on the corporate partnership side. I think it's less than 1% of corporate partnerships are invest in women's pro athletes, women's pro sports. So, and there are actually a lot of companies out there that are becoming more and more interested in the WNBA because our brand is really about diversity, inclusion, and equity. And there are many companies across the country, really globally, and most of them I would say probably are global companies, like Deloitte, that are really interested in partnering to kind of uh, express their alignment with that kind of vision, you know, not just for their workforce, but for what they as a company want to do. So that exposure is critical. And at some point, people have to think through, you know, they have their own buying decisions to make and the impact of their buying decisions on equity. Like if you want women athletes to be paid more, it, it, it is somewhat dependent on whether there's a market for right. what those women athletes make possible in the entertainment world. And at some point, fans have to step up. So if you find yourself, you know, feeling like you really want to, you know, you believe that women's soccer athletes should make more, WNBA players should earn more, well, show up, buy tickets, become season ticket holders, watch it, you know, watch games uh, on TV. There's no question that uh, purchasing behavior has to shift some. Yeah, yeah. And I was going to say, you know, some of the social media likes that people may give to what players say or or stuff with the, you know, league on whether it's Instagram or any of the uh, Facebook or any of the other channels. I mean, transfer that into either, uh, I want to say, transfer that emotion into getting broadcasters to, you know, show more of the women's programming because, you know, we've talked previously, um, you know, you've, you've shared with me that, you know, how, you know, um, the broadcasters play such a big role in changing viewership when it's dropping. Th- throw you know, throw some more games on TV, increase increase the viewership. Um, so you know, kind of for fans, it's like yeah, if you're you know a, a Facebook like or a Twitter like tweet, you know, like up a tweet or Instagram or whatever. That's that's nice, but you know, do something with it. Um, and we've seen the power of of individuals um, collectively on social media to change um, advertiser behavior. So. 
um, yeah, I'm I'm with you on that in terms of you know beating fans over the head. You know, put your put your money where your mouth is and and show up at those games. They're damn good games. I, I think um, you know one of the risks here is you know obviously shame doesn't blame and shame works not at all in compelling people to buy things. But you know one of the um, things that we've gotten very interested in in our franchise is is there a way to kind of uh, demonstrate what we believe is implicit bias by the sports media world. You know, one of the things, uh, you know, what what broadcasters have often said is, well, no one watches your games or, you know, the audience isn't big enough. Not no one. It's just it's not big enough. And we did some research and discovered that in night from there was a four year period, 1980 to 1984, which is, you know, deep, dark history. But at that point, the NFL lost 7% of their viewers, and Major League Baseball lost 26% of their viewers, which meant wow. that wow. Those networks were losing advertising dollars, right? Advertisers paid less. So what did the networks do? Now, if this were 2021, and this was a WNBA contract, that, you, know, net, you know, ESPN or whoever would be saying, well, you didn't deliver, so we're going to, you know, this is proof positive that no one's interested in you. This isn't a good business decision for us to continue to broadcast your um, games. But what the networks did then was they started airing even more hours of the NFL and Major League Baseball games. And why did they do it? They basically doubled down. They provided more exposure so that more viewers would have a chance to learn about and see these games and get drawn in. And lo and behold, the strategy worked. You know how popular certainly the NFL to the, is today. And even Major League Baseball continues to be highly lucrative on the broadcast side. But in women's sports, there is a very low tolerance for the idea that you have to invest first to promote growth. And you have to be a little patient. That's just... And you see this with women, you know, trying to break into politics. You see it in a lot of venues. And it's this idea that women have to deliver right away, that somehow we're not worthy of investing in. And that's exactly what the league and the owners challenged with this CBA, this new CBA. It's like, oh, no, we're putting our money up. We're betting on ourselves. We're betting on our women. We're betting on their expertise, their phenomenal expertise as amazingly good basketball players. You know? Wow. And it's, it's you a, know I would say that's a mic drop, mic drop moment in the in the interview there, I I, I would say, Ginny. <laughs> <laughs> I bet, and I bet, Mar- I know Marty's in the background, and I bet he agrees too. Uh, totally. Is that the reason, I suppose it's the reason, I believe you have an expanded 36-game season this year? Yes, and I think that's exactly right. And this it's this whole idea of you know, if we're going to if we're going to get more exposure, if if we want to have the players be here for a longer part of the year, what are we going to do? Well, let's well, let's expand the footprint, right? Uh let's create more games. We're having the Commissioner's Cup this year, mm-hmm. which will be, you know, the Friday right after the Olympics. Uh, After our Olympians come home, hopefully with Sue Bird's fifth gold medal and the seventh gold medal in a row for USA women's basketball, uh, which would be historic. We're going to have a commissioner's cup. The two top teams in the league are going to play each other. You know, again, something fun, different, mix it up format doesn't count to the uh, on the end of season standings. But let's get everyone back into women's pro basketball at the end of the Olympics. And you will see more of this. Mm -hmm. where we are going to showcase our players more. Maybe we'll grow the season more. We'll see. Mm. But that's the idea. Take advantage of these amazing players' capabilities. And they're, you know, really they want to play for hometown crowds, right? They want to play here. Do they really want to go to Russia and China? I think maybe for a year or two it's novel. And maybe as rookies it's great experience. They get to, you know, play on the court more and, hone their skills, improve more quickly. But I think by the time you're moving beyond your first few years, it's got to start to get old. Ginny, right, tell right. people tell people who Sue Bird is. Give us a little more information on her. Sue Bird. Hmm. She, I would say, okay, so Sue, I think, is 39 years old. She started uh, as a rookie for the Storm 
Ah, back in the early, she was our second number one draft pick after Lauren Jackson. So she's been playing for the Storm her entire career. Hmm. She's one of the best point guards in the world. She's definitely the best point guard in the WNBA. She's broken her nose. Hmm. Uh, I don't know, four times, five times. She's uh, she's one of those players who knows where her teammates are uh, yeah. on the court, can you know do no look passes, gets everybody calmed down, and uh, when things are getting frenetic, and also knows how to get everybody you know jazz takes that three point shot to tie the game. Yeah. Um, you know, amazing pressure player. She 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 was our pick in 2002. She had uh, two college uh, NCAA championships. She has three WNBA championships, and she has four gold medals. So uh, I I asked that question because I, I don't know. I'm asking the question here. I guess is telling those kinds of stories uh, are part and parcel of the marketing. Are they not a featuring uh, folks like Sue Bird and, and several college players that are now pro. Is that part of the marketing mix? Absolutely. And, you know, we have Rihanna, we have, we on the storm have Brianna Stewart, who mm-hmm. was uh, on the first UConn team, the first any uh, college team to win four straight NCAA Division One championships. Um, so, you tell her story. You have Skylar Diggins. You have Elena Deladon. You have Brittany Griner. Now you have Inescu coming up. She'll be coming out this year. There is no shortage of amazing stories, but absolutely having these women uh, become household names uh, is certainly part of what we're about. All right, yeah. Kelly. Uh, and you know what? I, and I was going to say, Marty and, and Ginny, listening to. Um, you know, the story of Sue Bird. I mean, this is also a story of, you know, the, the and just to ask you, Jeannie, you know, the value of having experience on the bench and not saying, oh, I'm sorry, you're X age, um, you, you need to retire now. Well, Sue is probably, I mean, you want to go back and watch an amazing moment. Semifinals uh, in 2018, game five at Key Arena when uh, Seattle was playing Phoenix. It was winner, winner take all, go to the finals. Uh, Sue was playing again with a mask on her face because Stewie had broken, uh, had elbowed Sue in the in game four and knocked her out. And you watch how Sue led that team to make it to the finals. And you know that her age is not holding her back. Um, but I think that's one of the special things about the league, frankly, and certainly even coming back to the CBA agreement, that there were... I want to say at least six players, possibly seven on the labor relations committee from their side. And they had young players, you know, uh, Lasia Clarendon was on that committee. Della Don was on that committee. The Aguma case sisters were, I think Elizabeth Williams and Sue was on the committee. So you had this, uh, really interesting diversity of players involved. And, you know, for many of them, uh, but especially Sue, this CBA, whatever they agreed to, was you know not going to affect her. Sue has maybe two years left. May I don't know. Maybe she'll play past that. I don't know. She and I don't talk about this regularly. But you know, the handwriting is on the w- wall, right? She's 39. So you had all these women on the committee thinking not about themselves, but about the future of the league. Mm-hmm. And that's, I think that's again an extraordinary aspect of our league is because these women know that. It's not just about entertainment. It's not just about their own personal careers. It's about creating a future for a possibility for, um, you know, what does it mean for the WNBA to grow and thrive well beyond their own tenure as individual athletes? And Sue really, to me, represents that. I mean, obviously, she's the person on the committee who I know the best. She's from my franchise. She's been a member of the storm longer than I've been an owner. I have tremendous respect for her on the court and off the court and her willingness to do all that work for a CBA that um, is really not about her at all personally. 
Wow. Wow, wow, wow. Well, I'm also thinking about your own career, Ginny, and thinking, oh, God, what, what else are you going to see in your lifetime as an athlete and a business owner and the, uh, you know, owner of a sports franchise, you know, from Title IX to Me Too? God, God knows what we're going to see next. I'm thinking uh, one of the key messages I've had from our conversation was your line, invest first for growth and be patient. Any other thoughts for business owners you would like to share based on the CBA experience? You know, life never goes the way your business plan uh, uh, projects, right? I mean, I, I've looked at enough, I'm in the investment business, I've looked at enough ventures, I've looked at enough great ideas to know that that thing on paper, that's great, that gets people excited, but show me a business plan that's unfolded precisely the way your business plan predicted and I'll have to eat my words but <laughs> you know it's just not how life works right you do the best you can to plan and then you have to deal with reality and I think the best businesses the the, the most on top of it entrepreneurs are the ones who are willing to confront the gap between what they hoped ha- what was going to happen or expected what what's going to happen and what in fact is happening and seek to close that gap as quickly as possible. Like you've got to learn from what's really going on. And this is a place where I really give the WNBA's players a huge amount of credit. You know, I've been in the, you know, fighting for equity business, if you will, since I was 17 and I'm now in my sixties. And frankly, sometimes it just gets really frustrating and tiring, but these young women come in and they're not frustrated. Well, they're, they're frustrated, but they are not tired. They are impatient and they are willing to do what it takes to challenge the naysayers and the haters and to broadcast the possibility that they see for you know, social change. And that ignites it further. And without them, you know, I don't know what the CBA would have looked like. I don't know what the future of the WNBA would have looked like. And much more importantly, I don't know what you know, our own social landscape would look like. And I think that's really what it's about. In a weird way, those women, even, yes, they're athletes, they're young, maybe they wouldn't, you know, some of them call themselves business women, but they are really entrepreneurs. They're partners with us in growing this league. And they, you know, they have to take some risk too in signing on to this CBA and voting for it. And that's, you know, having enough wisdom to see nothing comes easy, nothing comes, you know, nothing big happens without taking risk is a mark of maturity. And anybody, whether you're an entrepreneur, whether you're an artist, you know, regardless of what you want to do in life, you've got to take some risk. It's just not going to happen unless you're willing to get out there well beyond your comfort zone. If, if you're content not to make a huge difference in the world, don't worry about taking risk. But if you want to make something happen, you're going to have to, you know, be uh, at the edge of that limb waiting for the tree to grow. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Amen. Well, Ginny, thank you so very much. And for any of the listeners who are wondering the little noise in the background, Ginny's on a road trip. So you've even you know, taken time away from, from I'm going to say, your personal time for us again. And we're deeply appreciative. And again, hope you'll always come back because uh, it's always so great to talk with you. Well, thank you so much for having me on the show. Really appreciate it. It's folks like you who are willing to dig into these kinds of issues and help spread the word that really helps generate change. So thank you, guys. Thanks, Jenny. Thank you so much for listening to The Business Builder Show. To learn more about me, and I'm Marty Wolf, go to MartyWolfBusinessSolutions.com. That's Marty Wolf businesssolutions.com. To learn more about Kelly Hoey, go to her website, which is jkellyhoey.co. That's jkellyhoey.co. And of course, you can find Kelly and Marty on LinkedIn and Twitter. A reminder, you can find all our Business Builders shows on iTunes, Spotify, and on your favorite podcast app. Bringing the business classroom to you. It's the Business Builders Show with Marty Wolf. 